Okay. Thanks a lot, Atif, for offering me the possibility to chair this session. Uh, it's really a topic that is fascinating. So the panel essentially is going to broadly talk about the effect of capital flows for those fragile states that Atif talked about. And uh, you know, the, the main vision that was dominating in economics and to this day to a large degree is that international capital, international finance essentially does not work for developing countries, and in particular for those fragile countries. You know, back in the days, you know, in the early 90s, we had this, what we call Lucas paradox, which was, why is it the case that because in developing countries, the returns to capital should be extremely high, and so how can we explain that foreign investors, in particular, you know, US investors, European investors, are not sending capital to those countries, in particular, for instance, India. And given the differences in the rate of return that we estimate in our model, uh, that suggests that people are leaving a lot of money on the table, and you will need to have assumptions that are crazy high regarding the risk of expropriation, the risk of wars, the risk of extreme events to rationalize those differences. And so essentially, you know, the panel is going to discuss about those different topics. So Michaela Giorcelli from UCLA is going to bring some historical perspective to help us think about cases precisely where foreign capital flows actually worked. Um, then Jesse Schweger will tell us about why uh, we are probably vastly underestimating actually how much money is invested in those developing countries and why to a large degree our broad macroeconomic vision might be completely wrong. Um, thank you, Jesse. Uh, <laughs> Another reason for why uh, international finance might not work is because we probably don't have a good system to deal with cases where countries want to default. You know, uh, we had recently uh, some issues in Argentina, and you know, Jesse also work on this question. But in particular, Odlet Lino is going to help us think about what could be some optimal way uh, to find some resolution in case there is a creditor and debtor disagreement. And finally, Brad Sesser is going to give us a perspective regarding why, how those developing countries essentially try to deal with this issue, in particular by building very large savings accounts and large reserves that potentially create some instability uh, in the global system. So, Michaela, if you want to start. If some people in the back want to come, there are still three chairs here. Perfect. So hi, everyone. I would like to thank Atif and the rest of the organizing committee for um, organizing this uh, amazing conference and Adrian for moderating uh, our panel. So um, the, um, I would like to, to start with this, this conference with uh, an historical view of capital flaws and how capital flaws can help uh, uh, development uh, um, uh, using evidence uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, the Marshall Plan specifically. So just to put things uh, a little bit into a context, uh, uh, the main question, one of the main question in economics, economic development, is does foreign aid boost economic growth? And foreign aid are a prominent form of aid in developing countries. Uh, we are talking about uh, almost $17 million that have been uh, uh, mm, uh, given to developing countries by the U.S. Agency for International Development in 2019 and $4 trillion from 2014-2019, uh, which is roughly seven, time, seven times uh, the uh, GDP of Nigeria in uh, 2014. So, there is mixed evidence about uh, the extent to which uh, foreign aid help economic development. On the one hand, there is a correlation between the amount of aid uh, received by uh, countries and the growth rate of their GDP, but it has also been documented that there might be some negative unintended consequences, for instance, in terms of uh, 
Incre decreasing democracy, increasing conflicts uh, and corruption. And so uh, the World Bank uh, uh, report states that no matter the billion dollars spent in international foreign aid, little we know about uh, their actual impact on developing countries. So how can economic history be helpful in this respect? Um, so um, um, what I'm going to talk about today specifically is the Marshall Plan that was uh, a large uh, program of uh, international aid sponsored by the United States between 1948 and 1958 that has been uh, um, defined as the large aid program ever experienced in the uh, history, still in match in scope uh, and uh, uh, amount. It accounted for roughly 5% of GDP in, in uh, uh, 1948, so it's a definitely a sizable number. And I think that the interesting feature of this program is that it had different components. Uh, so if uh, it first gave to European countries recovering from World War II in kind subsidies, for instance, food, uh, medication, whose goal was to alleviate the war shortage. Then there was uh, the probably the most uh, well-known phase, money transfer, in order to rebuild infrastructure structure destroyed by the war. But there was also part of management and technology transfer in order to increase the firm productivity. So the program wants both to increase the economic development of Europe, but also increase the productivity. And uh, the advantages of using an historical context is that it's possible to evaluate the long run effects of uh, uh, this policy. It is possible to disentangle between different effects uh, of impact. Still today, foreign aid usually uh, um, encompass together different interventions so it's very difficult to disentangle the, the, the single component. And it's also possible to exploit some exogenous variation that is given by the specific context in which these programs were implemented. Um, so uh, the first phase of the Marshall Plan uh, was uh, uh, sponsored by the United States between 1948 and 1952. Uh, and uh, in this paper, we specifically focus uh, on uh, uh, the effect of the Marshall Plan on the recovery of the Italian economy. Italy was the third largest recipient of the money transfer from the, the Marshall Plan between 1948 and 1952. They account for roughly 2.3% of its uh, annual GDP in this time period. And uh, the great majority of these grants, like 80% of these grants, were used to rebuild infrastructure that were destroyed by uh, the war. Uh, we uh, have collected newly digitized uh, historical data at the province level uh, in which we have all the projects, all the reconstruction projects that were financed by the Marshall Plan uh, in these uh, uh, five years. So we're talking about roughly 15,000 projects. Agricultural and industrial outcomes uh, every 10 years between 1927 and 2001. And uh, uh, the um, a quantification of the damages caused by World War II in Italy, uh, mostly uh, coming from uh, uh, the bombing uh, 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 from the Allies between 1940 and 1945. So the first thing that we examine is how these uh, uh, grants were allocated across different parts of the country. So you can imagine that uh, um, uh, counties or provinces who have suffered more from the war, were struggling more with recover, could have received uh, more money. Actually, the, the way in which the United States decided to allocate these grants was strongly correlated with what happened during uh, the second phase of the war, specifically between 1943 and 1945. So there is a strong correlation between the attacks uh, after 1943 and the amount of uh, 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 grants that different uh, counties received. And the counties who were able to receive more grants from the Marshall Plan not only rebuild the existing infrastructure, but they were able to amplify and modernize, modernize their stock of infrastructure. So in terms of the empirical analysis, what we are doing is regressing industrial agricultural outcomes uh, at the province level in a given uh, census year on uh, province and uh, um, uh, region time fixed effect, as well as the amount of reconstruction grants that each province received after 1952. Uh, as I was saying, one can think that the, the OLS uh, uh, estimation might be biased, reconstruction grant may be not randomly allocated uh, to the country, uh, but they could have been uh, um, uh, focused more on uh, uh, counties that suffered more for the war. And so uh, in order to solve this problem, what we're doing is using the fact that the allocation of this grant is strongly correlated with the, the damages after World War II. 
And uh, uh, while um, before 1943-1944, uh, uh, most of uh, uh, the bombing were uh, attacking the most developed, most industrialized, most populated area of the country, after 1943, there is no significant correlation between county characteristics and the bombing received because uh, it was mostly due to some uh, the devolution of the war, the confrontation between Italian and uh, uh, German troops. Allies and uh, and German troops, so we used the uh, as an instrument for the reconstruction grants received by the different counties uh, the uh, the bombing uh, uh, between 1943 and 1945. And what we find is that counties that receive more reconstruction grants increase their agricultural outcomes. We have a 22% increase in wet and corn, 44% increase in grapes. Um, there is a reduction of agricultural workers and uh, a strong technology adoption that we measure as uh, uh, tractors uh, after uh, receiving these grants. Uh, we also find an increase uh, in uh, the number of firms uh, in the industrial sector and the number of employees. These are Created the characteristics of uh, economic uh, development and the effects are concentrated uh, among those small firms. Um, we um, we also um, try to, uh, to estimate in terms of the aggregate effect how much of the growth of Italy during uh, uh, the 50s can be due to the Marshall Plan. During these years, uh, um, Italy has the so-called economic miracle with the uh, annual GDP growth rate of roughly 6%. Uh, and uh, the characteristics of the Marshall Plan are the characteristics of a country economic development, like right? increase of agricultural production and decrease of worker in agriculture and increase in uh, uh, workers and firms uh, in the industrial sector. So what we do is first estimating the cross-sectional fiscal multiplier, and then we use the calibration in uh, um, Nakamura uh, and Senson in order to move from the cross-sectional to the aggregate multiplier. And what we find is that without the Marshall Plan, the um, Italian GDP growth rate would have been 1.3 uh, percentage point lower. And so we can uh, um, say that the Marshall Plan contributed to 22% of the uh, annual growth rate uh, of Italy um, during this period. Very briefly, uh, before concluding, even though um, 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 Italy, more in general Europe, was uh, uh, recovering from war, uh, even at the beginning of the 50s, the United States noticed that there was uh, an increasing productivity gap between uh, US and European firms. And so they also um, uh, sponsored uh, another program in the second phase of the Marshall Plan that was the Productivity Program. The Productivity Program between 1952 and 1958 promoting management tenant training trips for European managers and US firms and granted loans to buy uh, state-of-the-art machines produced in the United States that were not available for sale uh, in Europe. So uh, again, uh, in focusing uh, uh, on Italy, um, I collected data on around 6,000 firms eligible to apply for this program. Uh, firms uh, that could apply for this program initially were located in uh, uh, five uh, Italian uh, regions, you can think as uh, um, US states. Uh, after all firms applied, their application were reviewed, there was a budget cut, so the United States ended up implementing the program only in five small counties, one for the, in each of the original state that was eligible to participate in the program. So it's possible to compare the outcomes of firms that were located in uh, counties who eventually receive uh, the program with those of, count of, of firms located in counties that were uh, um, excluded by the program, controlling for firms' application into the program, so controlling for the self-selection of the program. And uh, what uh, uh, I find is that the firms that send their manager in the United States improved their performance. They were more likely to survive, have higher sales, employment, productivity, and the effects persisted over time. So if you look, for instance, at the dynamic of productivity, we can see that uh, it is 15% higher than firms that did not apply, uh, that apply but did uh, eventually not participate in the program, but the effects keep on increasing, reaching almost 50% after 15 years. Uh, by contrast, if we look at the effect of technology transfer, so receiving new machine from the United States, we can see that uh, there is an effect, there is a positive effect that is much smaller in magnitude and less persistent over time.
and uh, uh, if uh, we um, uh, we try to investigate uh, uh, what changed in firms uh, upon receiving the uh, managerial transfer from the US, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, firms start implementing the managerial practices that uh, uh, were taught during the training in the US, but uh, um, there were also some amplification effects coming from the fact that these firms were more likely to open new plants, increase the number of managers compared to the number of the rest of the workers, and they were more likely to become uh, uh, professionally managed firms instead of being uh, family uh, managed. Moreover, they also increased their access to loans, investment, and return on assets. So there were effects that went well beyond the the uh, uh, the adoption, the strict adoption of managerial practices, which uh, uh, can explain why the effects were so big and so persistent over time. So, um, to conclude, what we can learn uh, from the Marshall Plan uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, development. Uh, so, first of all, uh, I think that there are similarities between Europe after World War II and developing countries today. If you look at the level, the growth rate of the GDP during the 50s was very similar to some countries today, like India or other Southern Eastern Asian countries. Uh, and there were also some uh, um, uh, similarities in uh, what is the, the most important needs uh, in these countries. For instance, uh, um, uh, building infrastructure, building a uh, uh, transportation system. Moreover, the content uh, of uh, managerial training did not dramatically change over time. Some principles that were taught uh, in the 50s uh, are still uh, uh, taught today in business training programs that are usually implemented uh, uh, in developing countries. Uh, the Marshall Plan has some specific features that can explain why it was uh, so successful. So first of all, there was a strong cooperation between the US and the receiving countries. It's not that just a bunch of money were given to this country, but the United States were per periodically monitoring uh, what uh, um, countries were doing with this money. In the first phase of the Marshall Plan, for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, the use of money was constrained to specific projects that have to be approved by the United States before the governments can receive and use uh, this money. And uh, for the second phase uh, of the project, uh, of the plan, there was a strongly a strong cooperation between U.S. and firms. There was a period of three years of follow-up in which U.S. experts were visiting businesses which benefited from the program in order to see whether they were implementing, uh, implementing the techniques uh, learned uh, by the program. I think that uh, in, interpreti in interpreting these results, uh, uh, we also should take into account the fact that there are some important differences between Europe after World War II and developing countries today. Uh, first of all, uh, all European countries already as a successfully undertook the Industrial Revolution, so they were uh, um, uh, on a uh, um, uh, development pattern even before World War II, and they were probably closer to the technological frontier uh, compared uh, than, than some developing countries today. And also the level of uh, uh, human capital was on average higher than uh, uh, in developing countries today, which can explain why these countries were able to uh, adopt uh, uh, the new technologies that uh, um, uh, transfer by uh, the United States. So, um, so I think I'm out of time, but I'm also done. So thank you very much for your attention.